Uh, hello, everybody. Actually, thank you for inviting me in this uh, meeting. And uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Today is a beautiful day in Cincinnati. So whoever is in Cincinnati, please go out. So I became, uh, I'm working at Cincinnati Children's Medical Center right here now. <clears throat> and there I became interested in blood syndrome about 10 years ago when I was working in Vanderbilt. And uh, mainly because I was working on the mitochondrial energy metabolism, which is the <clears throat> uh, how a uh, cell makes energy to cardiac cells, especially because cardiac cells need enormous uh, energy because heart beats 100,000 times per uh, day and pumps 10 tons of blood. So uh, just imagine so much energy and uh, this tiny mitochondria that we have, all we have in cells, they make this image. So first I'm going to, uh, to uh, give you some uh, terms here, as uh, Shelley asked me yesterday. So uh, the terms we are going to use, so just get familiar with this. So first mitochondria, power plant of the cells, and the mitochondria generate energy for the cell. Okay? And the cardiolipin is a phospholipid, it's a building block of this mitochondria. And the tafazine, which actually uh, we see mutate, uh, mutations in the tafazine gene in blood syndrome patients, is necessary to uh, make this cardiolipin, this phospholipid. It's, tafazine is enzyme that helps to by, uh, by synthesis of the cardiolipin. And the TAS is a gene that encodes the tafazine, it's a DNA. So in other terms, we're going to use genotypes. It's organism full hereditary information. Basically, it's DNA sequence, gene sequence. And the phenotype is the organism's actual observed properties, such as morphology, development, behavior. So if we uh, think in terms of uh, disease, the mutation is the genotype, and the disorder, birth syndrome itself, is the phenotype. And uh, uh, Shelly also sent some questions to, I would like also to uh, answer before I go with the, <clears throat> uh, with the presentations. So is a wild type any, uh, animal model the same as animal you would buy in the pet store? Well, uh, not, uh, not exactly, because uh, we try to use in our uh, research um, inbred uh, organisms. So like uh, all siblings, they are like uh, identical twins in, our, uh, in animals. So it gives you the less variability in the phenotype. Which, while in the pet store, you can buy uh, animals that are <coughs> outbred. What's the difference between knockout and knock, uh, 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 knock in and knock out? And the knock out and knock down models, I will <coughs> show that. Uh, shortly, uh, why is Bart syndrome mouse a knockdown model? Uh, because we couldn't get a knockout. Uh, but uh, I think now it's there's a lighting uh, end of the tunnel, so we can uh, we can soon have a knockout model as well. <clears throat> so is it true that some animal models of Bart syndrome are uh, sterile? So we didn't see sterility in mouse models, but I've heard from and. Well, actually, I've read from uh, Mindong's, uh, in the Mindong's paper that the Drosophila uh, model was sterile, but I don't think it's relevant to the uh, humans. Uh, so, uh, and uh, this uh, address about uh, <clears throat> benefits of static animals uh, that have a short animal cycle. Um, I'll, sh I'll show you why it's important to study these animals. And there are other clinical trials. Yes, there are clinical trials on the animals. My models should be done before it goes to FDA. And it's highly desirable because often they ask it. Uh, and the rest of the questions I also show uh, during my presentation. So what's a gene knockout versus gene knockdown? So if we have a gene, uh, it's expressed through the transcription, so from gene, which is DNA, it's made RNA, and it's uh, it's a process called transcription. And from the RNA, it's made, it's made protein, so and that process is called translation. So this is normal pathway. 
you can see here. It happens in every organism for, and for thousands and thousands of different genes. And each gene has its own uh, DNA sequence, RNA sequence, and obviously protein. So what ha happens when we knock out gene? When we knock out gene, we either take this one of these elements out, those called exons, we take it out, and we in, sometimes we also in, in, introduce foreign sequence with the stop codon, so called so gene, gene cannot be transcribed to RNA. So it stops on transcription level here. While why, when we have a gene knock, knockdown, we employ a different strategy. We take, <clears throat> we target this part, RNA part. So gene is transcribed normally here. However, at RNA level, we introduce a short hairpin RNA. It's a small molecule that's uh, specifically bind to this RNA, RNA and destroys it. So there's no protein. So what's the difference in functionality? Here's 100% efficiency, so no protein is made at all. Here we can have less than 100% efficiency. So in our case with Barth syndrome, we have about 85-95% of efficiency. So it means that about 10% of protein is still made, but it's enough to show. It's not enough to actually <clears throat> uh, to organs to function normally. But uh, yes, we are trying to get in this uh, in this stage, and uh, I think um, Bill Poo is making now the knockout model. Also, I think. Someone also in the England or Scotland made these uh, models. It should be available um, in the next few months. Okay. So what's the, uh, about mitochondria? Why I became uh, interested in Barth syndrome because I was working on these mitochondria and the mitochondria power plants of the cell. So they make energy, and uh, it depends which cells we have. Is energy can be, uh, I mean, mitochondrial content can be high or low. So, heart needs the uh, lots of energy. So, heart muscle, heart cell, cardiac cell, we call the cardiomyocytes. They're packed with, they loaded with this mitochondria. I'll show that too. Uh, and uh, modeling human diseases. When we modeling human diseases, when uh, we should uh, think about. Um, uh, what we want to know, first thing. When I became interested in Barth syndrome, only this EAST model was available. And the EAST is a great model, and uh, you can do lots of things, and it's actually been lots of knowledge about um, uh, enzymatic uh, properties of the uh, tafesin has been investigated in uh, this EAST model. However, if you want to study heart, you need a model that has heart, actually. So that's why we uh, turn to zebra efficient mice. Um, and uh, another group also was trying to uh, studying the uh, Drosophila model of the Barth syndrome. So, first thing we did is uh, actually uh, start learning about the zebra fish, how oh, it was a brand new field for me. And uh, this uh, making mouse, it's more long term story and uh, it's not so easy. So, our zebra fish can be done very quickly. So. Uh, why zebrafish is an uh, interesting model and what advantages it has. Because genetic manipulation is easy, so it's very easy to actually knock down genes. 84% of disease-causing genes in humans have zebrafish counterparts, or they share genes, the genome is uh, similar. So they have short development to phenotype, so literally hours. So after you inject uh, with the compound that causes gene knockdown, in two days, you can see the outcome of this uh, genetic manipulation in zebrafish. Well, for example, in mice, you need to wait months. Uh, very important feature is body is transparent. So you don't have to dissect uh, embryos. You can see through it. So your heart is beating in the live embryos, and I'll show them. You can see and assess this function without actually dissecting and um, like we have to do with mice. Uh, there's this advantage, two-chambered heart, while human heart has, human heart is four-chambered, 
uh, smaller than the mice, so you cannot do much manipulations with this, and you cannot get uh, enough material to study uh, molecular mechanics. And they're cold blooded, so the metabolism is quite different in uh, zebrafish than in uh, heart, than in mouse hearts. But this is a great model to study the cardiac development, how cardiac heart do, because in the early stage development, they're quite similar, mouse, human, and zebrafish. Okay, and this is zebrafish facilitated ventricle. So you walk in, there's a hundred, hundreds of fish tanks in the racks, and they have thousands of fish. So they are, uh, fish are uh, maintained in very controlled environment with the temperature and uh, with the nutrition, etc. Uh, and the old fish are similar, so the zebra fish are like, a, you cannot distinguish one from another. Uh, what happens when we do the zebra fish studies? Uh, you go in the morning, uh, lights come on uh, in the room, so when light comes on, the females lay eggs, uh, males fertilize, and the researcher picks up these eggs in the petri dish and takes them to the uh, station where you can with the microcapillaries, you can inject special compounds called morpholinos that binds to the RNA and destroys it. Okay, and specifically designed to destroy tafazin RNA. So uh, this is a zebrafish embryo, and it's a two cell stage. So it should be done in 20 minutes after they are laid on. And this is yolk sac. So here's the needle that goes inside, and you have to do in the microscope under the microscope, inject very small amount, and uh, put back in that uh, petri dish and wait for another 24 or 51 hours to see what's going to happen with them. So those are the zebrafish in the development. So it's uh, this stage we inject, and uh, this is the how they develop in seven hours, 12 hours, how they look. Uh, 24 hours, or even 51, right? So this is the just, uh, uh, oh, this is a tafazin gene expression in this embryo, so its band intensity uh, shows the, how much tafazin is made in each stage. So what happens when we inject this um, uh, morpholinos is, that's what happens. Part syndrome uh, zebra fish, they do have this enlarged structure, like a bubbles kind of structure. It's better you can see here or here. Uh, heart is inside, and uh, this is bubble uh, and filled with the filled with the pericardial effusion, the liquid that actually tells us the early stage heart failure is happening. So this is normal uh, zebra fish. They don't have this. Well, at least they have have it, but it's uh, it's small. But uh, they have this enlarged peri uh, pericardial edema. And this is heart, you can see the shape of the heart in normal uh, zebrafish, and the shape in heart in the tafazin knockdown, or part syndrome zebrafish, it's like a tube-like. And uh, if this are uh, heart rate, so heart rate goes down also significantly. Most importantly, what we also we can do with the zebrafish, it's uh, try to rescue this uh, by providing the normal gene. So we injected the normal RNA of this uh, tafazin into the uh, and developing embry embryos. And uh, we rescued this phenotype from here. Phenotype is a feature that's uh, actually what we observe, cardiac disease, for example, here, and to here. So it's uh, completely, almost completely rescued by, and it's relevant for future if we go to, with the um, gene therapy. And uh, this was done almost uh, 10 years ago now in uh, Vanderbilt. So since that, we are, we are trying to Oh, this is the, I don't know if you can see this, but do you see this? Um, this is... Uh, we do see it. I'm sorry, we were muted. Uh, Movie. Okay. Okay. So, and uh, this is embryos that are um, injected with morpholino. So, you just see this bubble here. And slow beating heart. And even eyes are a little different. And uh, this is rescued after we injected normal gene. You can see the heart rate goes up, and this bubble is gone. Those are different uh, types of uh, morpholinos also which we're trying to use. Uh, and uh, all of them, these have this 
big bubble pericardial effusion. And there is a heart how it beats. And that's why it's interesting because it's transparent so you can see heart through the body. Um, so, uh, Zebrafish uh, is uh, a great model. I really like it, but um, it has the possible uh, medicine or uh, therapeutic agents. Um, we need a mouse model because mouse is uh, warm blooded and has four chamber heart, and if you go let's say, for FDA, so they, they really need to use them. Uh, it's an advantage to have a mouse model. Uh, we tried uh, to make and lock out uh, mice uh, several years, but we didn't get it for I know uh, it's uh, for complicated reasons because it's X chromosome and an X chromosome probably it's important for also uh, uh, sper spermatogenesis, so we couldn't get this uh, males to transmit this transgene. But um, <clears throat> um, Bartzino Foundation uh, made a great effort, and the mouse model of Bartzino, the knockdown model, became available in 2009. These mice were viable and fertile, which is important because it allows us to study them. And uh, no, had no abuse, uh, abnormalities while they're three months old, except they had little lower body weight. So we tried to see what's going on these mice. Uh, Look deeper, and then we took the samples of heart, and I looked into the under the electron microscope. So this electron microscope images of cardiac muscle, and it's blown up. It's zoomed uh, thousands of times, uh, probably you know, five or ten thousand times here. But anyway, uh, those are the mitochondria. You see these uh, prolonged dark structures here. Those are the mitochondria, and cardiac muscle is packed with them. While in other cells, you can see few, but uh, not so dense. And the shape of mitochondria in heart is also, um, if they prolong, they packed with the crista. Crista is in the inner membrane of mitochondria where actually energy is uh, generated. And uh, those are the sarcomeres. It's the um, contractile apparatus of the heart. So it's what makes heart beat. So everything is neat in order, you see here is here. Well, in the toughest knockout hearts, it's everything is messed up. So mitochondria are uh, uh, smaller and fragmented and more irregular in shape. Uh, also, sarcomeres are degraded, you can see, and disarrayed. So that's when we uh, knew that something is wrong is, uh, this, with these mice. And the even more uh, bizarre structures we see in skeletal muscle. Uh, all this, uh, we call it onion skin uh, structure, and those are the honeycomb structures. Those are mitochondria, but it's um, irregular, uh, with irregular structure. So it looks like these mitochondria are going through the recycling process called mitophagy. So those uh, cell, uh, cell actually digest this mitochondria and removes them because they're dysfunctional. And uh, uh, there are empty structures. You can see those where mitochondria were, so they're gone now. But it uh, looks, looks like a cell also makes more new mitochondria, so the mitochondria recycling process is speed up. So we have something that we need to investigate in the future. Um, so here we see um, what we did in this echocardiography first. Um, we can see this uh, an echo. Um, these hearts are more dilated, but they uh, show this phenotype, this feature of the dilated heart in, by eight months of age, after seven months of age, before at three months of age, they are normal. And then you can see that this is normal and this is the toughest in knockout hearts, these are um, dilated. And this was done with cardiac MRI on these mice. Those mice are sedated and uh, you know, we take a look to it several minutes, 15 minutes, I think, we recorded this. Well, this is much easier to do, echocardiography. Another thing we did uh, with these mice, and we couldn't done with any other, uh, I mean, without animal models, is the proteomic studies. And uh, these proteomic studies that actually allows to uh, compare uh, protein samples from 
two different uh, two different samples. In our case, it was control sample from normal mice and uh, from Tafazi knockdown or Barth syndrome mice. So we have the way to separate proteins, and the atlas are not only uh, not uh, cardiac proteins, but only mitochondrial proteins, mitochondrial subset of cardiac proteins, because cardiac proteins. I mean, there's about several uh, about. 20 or 30 different thousand different proteins, but here we took only some little subset. And here we can see 2300 uh, prote different proteins. So that each spot is, um, corresponds to a unique protein. Right? So we have a way to separate them with a the two dimensional electrophoresis. Uh, and then um, we, uh, we attached dyes. The green dye, fluorescent dyes, and red fluorescent dyes to the sample separately. So we separated them, we computer detected 2300 different proteins. And after this, we overlapped, overlapped these images. And the, everything that yellow, it means that if you could take green, uh, red here and green here, you merge, you get a yellow. So yellow mean, means that these and these are uh, present in the equal amount. But if you see something like here, a small dot with red, so it means that this, from in this sample, this protein is overpresented. So we detected this, and the computer also did this uh, work. And uh, I have troubles to advance slides. And we found 82 different proteins in mitochondria that were different between uh, normal and um, Barth syndrome uh, hearts. And uh, those are all marked here. And then we flag them and that there is a uh, robotic uh, machinery that takes each of these spots from this media, from the electrophoresis media called gel, and uh, identifies them. Um, identifies what kind of protein is that. So this is the uh, image gel, so it detected this and this. In this case, uh, we analyzed peak volumes of this, uh, and uh, we can see that here it's smaller than it's higher. So that means that in barcidum hearts, it proteins are over represented. So it means that a heart makes more of these proteins to compensate, probably something. And so we pick up this spot, a small needle with robot, a robotic arm takes it, and then we collect them here. We analyze also statistically that these differences are uh, real. Uh, not random, and after this, we came up with short list of these proteins that are different, decreased in tafazin knockouts or increased in tafazin knockouts. So from these proteins, we now can see what's uh, which metabolic systems are upregulated or increased or decreased, and uh, we just published this two weeks ago. This paper in the plus one. And uh, we also applied bioinformatics tools to study these um, uh, metabolic systems because each protein is not alone. Each protein interacts with uh, dozens or hundreds of other proteins. So, and uh, if you increase or decrease one of these proteins, it affects all of them. So it doesn't affect single house, it affects whole village. And, uh, uh, from this um, bioinformatic analysis, we came up with a um, list of metabolic systems that are affected in Barth syndrome mice. And uh, those are, the, for example, mitochondrial dysfunction. We, we knew it because mitochondria is a mitochondrial protein. Oxidative phosphorylation. Well, we uh, also knew it. But folate metabolism, for example, we didn't knew it was affected and the proteomic analysis showed the folate metabolism is upregulated in this cardiac muscle. Amino acid metabolism to one carbon metabolism. So these are the examples that uh, things we couldn't do without animal model because we couldn't get the protein samples from the heart, so at least the amount we need another way. Uh, and uh, other things we can do, we can do physiological study with animal models, or we can do the uh, drug uh, trials, mini trials at least, before it goes to the 
uh, FDA and uh, with limited human trials, studies on the mouse are needed. Uh, so these are the, this is the metabolic chamber where we put mouse and the mouse uh, lives there for 40 to 72 hours with a, or with a food uh, and uh, with water, but um, fresh air goes in. Uh, but uh, machinery analyzes how much oxygen is, takes uh, consumes this mouse and how much carbon dioxide it makes. And uh, this uh, machinery that actually analyze all these gases. Uh, it, it was an example of the mouse in the resting condition when it uh, doesn't do any work, but we can also make them run the treadmill and do the same studies here. And uh, this is mouse that uh, just goes in, uh, we put uh, in the metabolic chamber and it explores everything and this is actually tough as a knockout mouse. And uh, this is mouse when it runs on the treadmill. So I think uh, this mouse really enjoys it. Um, but this is the very mild condition. So we, when we increase the you know, slope or speed, mouse it fails to keep up with them. Um, so after this, uh, all these data are collected online and it's analyzed by computers. For for example, we can see that. Tough as a knockout mice consumes cannot consume as much oxygen as uh, normal or wild type mice, and uh, they cannot run. Even this is also this uh, metabolic studies results, and uh, they can run uh, for certain uh, stage. After this, they just hit the wall; they cannot run anymore. And uh, wild wild type control mice they continue to run a treadmill long time without much problem. And those are the drug trials we're trying to with the pesofibrate with Barsinger Foundation to um, study the efficiency of these uh, drugs how before it goes to the uh, FDA. And you can see that um, <clears throat> it's uh, controlled mice. It doesn't uh, has any effect on cardiac function. However, it's uh, in the toughest knockout mice it greatly improves the cardiac function if you give this drug for a short time, but it has some uh, issues with toxicity, so we have to address this, we have to study this, but at this point we are in the middle of the, in the middle of the studies. Um, <clears throat> so in summary, um, I hope I can convince you that uh, model, model organisms are essential tools for biomedical research and Animal models allow to study human disease in uniform and genetic background, so all animals are same, variability is very low. Uh, also, very important that animal models are free of medication, so if you can do the human subject because patients, because they take medication, so it's picture is not that clear as in mice. Um, and animal models allow to test therapies and procedures that cannot be performed in humans. So that's it. Um. Faza, thank you very much. We had um, one of the one of the attendees had a question for you, and um, I've asked the other attendees if they could just let me know if they have any questions. You don't need to type it in. I can take you off of mute, and you can ask Saza any questions you have. Um, but Michaela Damon would has a question for you, Michaela. Okay. Unmute yourself. Go ahead and ask that question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Zaza. Um, I just wanted to ask you, I see that Doug Strathy's paper has just been published. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. It actually came out on Friday. Which yeah. paper? What? Um, okay, so his paper is entitled, Mouse Tapazin is Required for Male Germ Cell Meiosis and Spermatogenesis. And that's also okay. in, in uh, is it PLOS, the PLOS? That, that, Journal. Okay, who, journal. Okay. So this and, is Doug Strathy, um, who is in Scotland, who did the knockout, um, the knockout mouse model, also funded. Oh, okay. No, I haven't uh, seen this. It was in Friday, is that? It just came out on Friday, apparently. Okay. Yeah. So I thought I would let you know. I'll, I'll check. As okay. I said, my computer was down on Friday. I couldn't do anything. Okay. Thank you.
basically. Any other questions? Michaela, was there something specific that you had maybe thought? Can I ask you another question? Yes, you can. And if you had something specific about the paper that because he hasn't read it yet, maybe you can let him know any questions you might have had about the paper. I actually haven't had a chance to read it myself either, so because it's literally just come out. But I believe it was a knockout model rather than a knockdown model. But I'm I'm not 100% sure, and yes. it definitely seemed to address the issue of infertility as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that seems to have come up again, and I was just wondering what that would mean to to bath research. Well, in knockdown models, we didn't see the, uh, we didn't see much uh, infertility because, as I said, about 10% uh, of tafasin gene is still synthesized. Maybe that's enough and gives us idea about threshold how much tafasin is needed to um, keep a spur um, mobile um, and alive. Uh, uh, we do see the some um, decreased uh, decreased little size because in mouse we have um, uh, mice give like a seven to eight and uh, live pups and uh, we see sometimes five to six so that means there may be some um, uh, embryonic lethalities happening in these mice which uh, Colin Fun actually show this uh, decreased little size also because of this cardiac uh, failure in uh, embryonic stages also. Mm -hmm. That's what we all, all, all see, but it's, I'll, I'll be very interested to read this. Yeah. yeah, because I mean, certainly if we look at our, uh, you know, at our members, we know that, you know, adult bath males are having families and having children of their own. So I was just wondering if that was maybe not linked more to the male death, you know, in utero. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I agree. It could be that because of embryonic lethality in the uterus. That's why we couldn't get uh, in initially this toughness in mice uh, knockout because uh, all males were sterile, but we know it was because of toughness in function itself or the locals are targeted on the X chromosome because that could be important also just for maturation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question um, from one of the moms who is here in Kentucky, not Ohio. Um, so Bree has a question. Hi, um, I was just wondering, you discussed when you inject the zebra fish, like they're the little eggs, and I was curious at what point you do that for the mice since they're mammals and they don't lay eggs, how, how do you go about that? Well, we take a, um, we use a technique that's called um, homologous recombination in embryonic stem cells. So we take embryonic stem cells. Uh -huh. we, we we do the, our genetic manipulation in these embryonic stem cells in cell culture in petri dish, and after this, we select only those cells that were had a desired mutation, and after this, from these cells we make mice. So it's actually, we don't we do not do that, but there's a uh, core facility in each uh, large institution. Uh, you give them the cells, they inject into the embryos, and the embryo, in the normal embryo mouse, embryo uh, normal mouse, and uh, uh, after this, these ES cells, they take over, take over the embryo and they actually embryo is made from this um, genetically modified ES cells. So this is very um, uh, difficult. Uh, I mean, it's hard to get these um, um, embryonic stem cells to make uh, actually mice. And it's a bottleneck for our, in our research. It takes months and months and years, maybe. And uh, it's uh, hard to get because if you fail, you don't know until the end you failed. So you go all maybe two years, and the final you found it's failed. So that's why nobody likes to do it, uh, but we have to do it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but yes, it's a, a manipulation of embryonic stem cells, genome of embryonic stem cells. That's what happening instead of zebrafish in, in mice. 
um, unless there's any more questions. I'm going to do a going, going, gone kind of thing. Zaza, we really appreciate your your being here. This has been so helpful and and educating us about the how important these animal models are in birth research. And I thank you for doing it in a way that people who don't have PhDs can understand. <laughs>